And I think if it's all right with you, Roberto, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know we've got some more people joining us. We had quite a large crowd signed up, but I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to hear from you and also to hear from our audience today as well. So we're so happy to have you here with us. Um, so welcome everybody to Prof of Pores Dynamic Human Anatomy. For anyone who's new to events um, at PAFA, I'm Abby King, the Assistant Director of Adult Programs here at PAFA. And I'm so excited to have so many of you here with us today. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to take this moment before introductions to acknowledge that where I'm speaking to you all from in Philadelphia are the ancestral lands of the Lone Lenape people whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. I also wanted to start by thanking any of our PAFA members, our museum members who are here um, with us. Thank you for supporting us today and every day. Um, you help us have free programs like this. So if you're interested in future programming or supporting the museum or PAFA as a whole institution, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat for more information on that. Thank you. Yeah, and just a couple of quick Zoom thoughts and announcements before we get started. This program is being recorded, um, as you can tell. So um, it is being recorded and we are gonna be uploading it to our YouTube channel later this week. Um, so if you know of anybody who missed it or if you, for some reason, your Wi-Fi goes out, know that it will exist in the world and I'll drop the link to that in the chat momentarily as well. I also wanted to, before I hand things over to a special guest who's here to introduce our speaker today, um, I wanted to let you know the overall um, order of the program, excuse me. So we're gonna have an introduction by Renee Folks in just a second. And then Roberto is going to be sharing their screen and presenting for the next hour or so. And then we are gonna make sure to have time at the end of the program for questions. So if you'd like, you can drop questions in the chat as we go. We will um, try to address as many of them as we can at the end of the program. Um, we'd love to hear from all of you. The other things I want to mention that this program is in conjunction with several exciting promotions. The first of which I know many of you already know is to celebrate the release of Roberto's Osti's, Roberto Osti's book. And we have a special promo code from the publishers for this event. Um, when I drop all of the links I keep mentioning, I'm gonna include that one as well. But if you like what you hear today, you should definitely pick up a copy. And also if you leave today wanting to learn more about anatomy or getting to learn from the artist himself, he is going to be teaching some classes for our continuing education program. And there's still a few days left to register for those April, May courses. Some of them include figure drawing, watercolor and more. So I'm also gonna put in some links to that at the end. Um, so now I'd love to just hand things over to Renee Folks, our chair of drawing and a professor at PAFA. Thank you so much for being here, Renee. And I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Um, well, hello, everyone, and, and welcome again to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the school as well as introduce Roberto. Um, as the nation's oldest art museum and school, uh, we teach from and support the figurative tradition. Uh, we have a rich heritage in working from the figure, and that was developed early into a formalized curriculum under the guidance of Thomas Aikens. Um, and the use of an extensive cast collection, life drawing, painting, sculpture, and anatomical study courses still form uh, a core component of our educational structure as a 21st century institution here at the Academy. Uh, students in all of our departments, animation, drawing, illustration, painting, printmaking, sculpture, all study from the human form. And we do so for its inherent beauty, uh, for the complex formal structures of the body, and for the body's historical and contemporary narrative potentials. Today, it's my pleasure especially to introduce one of our esteemed faculty members, Roberto Asti. Roberto is in demand as an educator at multiple institutions and multiple programs, as you heard, uh, not only our um, day school where Roberto teaches uh, studio anatomy, but in the CE program and at institutions uh, all across the area. Formally trained as a medical illustrator, uh, Roberto has contributed to numerous uh, scientific and art publications. And as a fine artist, his exquisite paintings have been shown throughout Europe and the United States. 
Roberto's first book, Basic Human Anatomy, uh, was released in 2016 and became an art, art instruction bestseller. Uh, so now he's here with us this afternoon to share some of his concepts from his newly released book, uh, Dynamic Human Anatomy. So um, we are so thrilled to have you here, Roberto. Welcome and thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much. Thank you. So guys, welcome. Thank you for showing up in rows. It's really flattering and nice. So um, without further ado, I would like to start uh, showing you some images. And um, as I mentioned before, I will uh, um, start um, from, um, okay, first, you know, this is a new book, the cover of the book. We, I also have some contact in here on the screen that if you want, you can take a screenshot for both me and the school. Um, and um, um, I would like to start with this uh, presentation, uh, discussing um, the, if you want, the, um, why is not going? You need to try the arrows on the bottom. Do you see those? Yeah, I tried that. Did they they'll go bong? Come again. Hmm. Hi. All right. So let's exit and start again. Yeah, I gotta do that. We're gonna stop the share screen. Strange, right? So okay, start again. It's always something with Zoom, but here we go. And then it was working before, right? Just as, huh. Okay, let me try to do this again. Okay. Now escape doesn't work. If you hover on the arrows, Roberto, down below, oh. there we go. All right. Okay, now it goes, it works, right? So strange, right? This is a uh, mystery of technology, which is more, more and more like magic, right? So um, I am starting um, this presentation um introducing a, a a very little known but fantastic artist that was a, a pisanello he was an artist that was um between the gothic tradition and the renaissance right in the middle and uh, i chose him because um he uh through him, I can I can bridge the two period, the two eras, where the way of looking at the world changes. So, as you can read in the title, um, I'm saying uh, I'm describing this period as like looking at the world for the first time. Like uh, uh, imagine imagine an adolescent person that um, sees the world, everything for the first time. Everything is so exciting. Everything so new. And uh, and Pizzarello had this kind of um, he, he kind of lived in a in a constant state of, uh, of artistic frenzy, seems to me, because he was drawing and drawing and drawing constantly. And drawing is, um, I think, is a way of um, analyzing the world or looking at the world. It's not just copying. It's a way of becoming aware of it, because as you draw, you process your subject, and then you uh, recreate it, reproduce it um, with your uh, uh, visualizing your synthesis right so drawing has this as a is a it can be a, a, an incredibly creative conceptualization of a subject so but there is a uh, some systematization some systematic approach to this as we're going to see in his early uh, drawing by Pisanello so um you see how he goes from fashion costume to animals uh the systematic uh, research, the study of uh, animals that he has is, is incredible. You might want to look him up later and enjoy the incredible amount of works. But the systematic approach that he has, it made me think of the uh, analytical approach that later on is developed during the Renaissance and uh, that eventually uh, ushered in the scientific uh, method of uh, um, systematic study and uh, uh, finding the typical aspect of um, anything from human being to horses to animal etc so um these studies though um were, were a lot of fun clearly because he goes from sturgeons to to horses to uh, dogs feet and uh, and monkeys and um, humans right uh pisanello um he probably was involved in uh, in battle he was in battle during one of the wars between uh, 
city states, I think specifically between Milan and, uh, and, and Venice. And you can see, um, the, as, as you can see in the image on the lower left, is quite, is quite realistic of, uh, of a warrior killing an another one in, uh, in clearly not a, uh, a um, contrived way, it's just pure butchery, right? And then you see all these other drawings that he did uh, between uh, nude models at the center, uh, this dignitary from who knows where on the upper left, and these um, hair drew, hair, uh, hair, hair uh, uh, dues of uh, um, noble women, so probably at the court of uh, Verona or Naples or uh, Venice or who knows where, because he traveled from Venice to, to, um, to Naples where he died. He also tackled the darkest uh, or uh, less um, uh, less proper uh, aspect of life. Meaning, on the upper left, we see a, a uh, allegory of of lust uh, with the rabbit that symbolizes uh, frequent copulation. On the right, we see these uh, systematic drawings of hanged people, and they are not really um, they're not really uh, they're real. You can see that some are in a state of decomposition. Uh, some are just freshly hanged with the breeches half down. And um, there is a um, this systematic approach going around somebody who's hanged, copying him from different angles and his different state of decomposition has, uh, I would say, uh, a sort of semi-detached analytical approach that we were gonna see later on uh, in the Renaissance, right? So eventually Pisanello used all these studies, not all of them, some are just drawing for sake of drawing. Um, he used them for his beautiful paintings, frescoes, many of whom were destroyed for various reasons. And you see on the left, you see this, this uh, writer um, with this elaborate headdress and all these animals whom he studied in detail um, with various sketches from life. He was studying from life. Uh, one sketch that didn't fit in this presentation showed uh, uh, different nostrils of horses uh, in various stages of opening, and I found it. I found that so incredibly, uh, uh, I don't know, interesting. Right? Who wants to see uh, the horses' uh, nostrils widening and closing? He did because probably being having been in battle, he kind of was able to to. Uh, witness firsthand the emotional, uh, the dramatic emotional impact that battle can have. On the right, we see instead that those sketches uh, that he prepared about hanged people were then um, um, used in a, in a, in a painting on the, um, um, in this painting here on the on the right. See these these two hanged people, right? So um, another very important um, artist that. Um, um, is we can say he is at the beginning of the Renaissance, is Polaiolo. Polaiolo um, was um, one of the first, if not first artists that um, uh, dissected bodies. And um, pretty quickly, the dissection of the bodies um, that these artists were performing makes uh, its way into the paintings as we will see later on. This uh, uh, engraving is uh, a drawing, this is a drawing is um, um, titled uh, Lamentation Over the Body of a Hero. So, and this is typically a typical humanistic uh, uh, approach now to the arts and to the world, meaning that the, the deceased body is not uh, a criminal that's being killed, someone who died of, for, for various reasons, but, or that is eventually put on a dissection table because that is a dissection table, but becomes a hero. And, uh, and then you have the lamentation of, uh, um, of uh, friends and family around him. Notice also the parallel here with the lamentation of the, the uh, dead body of Christ that is uh, uh, something that comes from the Gothic and moves on all the way through the Renaissance. Uh, but in this case in here, we have uh, a parallel between uh, a sacred and, and uh, it, let's say it's a, a juxtaposition between sacred and profane. The Christ's body is similarly um, uh, laid down on a flat slab uh, in uh, in the uh, lamentation of the, 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 that Christ, as this is um, uh, over a, an anatomical slab. 
but this is this is um, uh, a hero, is a person, is a, is a warrior, and uh, this reflects the humanistic uh, person, uh, the humanistic approach in art, uh, in my opinion, because. The humanistic thought shifts the, the interest of uh, the, the philosophical, religious, uh, artistic uh, interest or research from the divinity to the human uh, condition, the human uh, being. Um, this is um, an example of very famous, one of probably the biggest engravings um, that have been ever, ever made uh, by Polaiolo, where he put to work all his knowledge of anatomy in this um, Battaglia degli Ignudi, the Battle of the Naked People, right? <laughs> so, which is quite a sight, I guess. But um, of course, it's an excuse to show off the um, anatomical research that he was he was uh, performing, like this section together with his brother, various bodies. Um, so, from here, uh, we get more into. Um, I want to I also wanted to include these two ingredients because. Um, now we're going to move into uh, the Renaissance, although this is past the Renaissance, but it is uh, showing, it's a play that shows a shift in thought between uh, the late Renaissance and, um, and uh, moving on to, to the 1700s. And on the left, we have uh, the um, organization of, uh, of, of a, an academy in Rome about mid-1500. And we see how, um, I already showed this uh, in occasion of other um, um, uh, webinars, but in this case, uh, I, I'm pairing it with another image, which I didn't show. So in this case in here, we see the uh, Roman Academy probably, uh, where we have um, a great attention on dissection, right? So this is a real cadaver uh, that is being dissected in the classroom as the students are Copy and these, as you can see, are very young, very, very young students. So, skeleton is real, the body is real and fresh. The teacher is dissecting the body and they are copying, they're sketching. So, uh, artists uh, were receiving a thorough, incredibly thorough um, um, anatomical um, uh, education in the academy. It was part of the system. Um, but later on, um, we have uh, here on the right, an academy of uh, the 1700. And I included this because I want to show you how the approach to the study, the human body or anatomy shifts during a period that is ushering in eventually the neoclassical art, right? So we here uh, see, and so this is the motto, right? Or the motto for this artwork in here. And it's tanto che basti e mai abbastanza. Tanto che basti means just enough, my abbastanza means never enough. What is that meaning? Some things you have to study uh, just enough to get by, and other things you have to, you never will have, have enough of studying those, right? Uh, in here, we see that the, the highest, uh, the highest uh, um, preoccupation uh, or, or the, the thing that was considered the most important for an artist training was muses, right? The muse, the inspiration. And in here, there is a, something that says, uh, without us, forget it. <laughs> right? Or senza di noi, ogni fatica è vana. Without us, any effort you might make, it will lead to nothing. So you need a muse as an inspiration of, of art, right? And then it's here, we says, these are classical models, right? These are sculptures. And um, um, these, they are, these are also my abastanza, meaning the, the anatomical knowledge now was mediated um, via sculptures. There was not, the dissection was not as important anymore, but as you can imagine now, we have a, a derivative knowledge of anatomy during this period. And that uh, um, usually it's really not necessarily good because what you're doing is you are, um, not experiencing uh, anatomy directly as the artists of the Renaissance were, um, but you are experiencing it through the interpretation of another artist. So it tend to be derivative, right? So uh, in, uh, um, uh, in the um, work below, in the images below here, we see that geometry here, right? This, this, uh, this thing here says geometry here. Tanto che basti, just enough to get by, right? 
um, perspective, eh, okay, you can do it. Like, don't talk about it, just enough. Uh, but these on top, where they, 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 um, this thing that absolutely any artist should should uh, uh, privilege, right? So we see that that the um, contact with the human body, with the physicality of the human body, is now in this period limited. Whereas during from the from the uh, early Renaissance to the High Renaissance, the dissection was was very very important. And why is that? Because if you think about um, that, this is an example of, uh, of the works of high Renaissance, right? Uh, we have Titian in the middle and um, the um, knowledge that this artist had of anatomy was, was sublime, was excellent. If you um, have a knowledge of anatomy that is so thorough, the images that you create, the body that you create are going to be incredibly powerful emotionally. Uh, and they can, they can convey uh, a sense of death or sense of life, right? So if you paint somebody who's, who's uh, in a martyrdom or dead uh, or killed or, uh, or, or running, et cetera, and you know anatomy, your work is going to be so much more powerful in, uh, in rendering these uh, um, emotions and movement, et cetera. Um, as you can see on the right, on the right there is a work by Vesalius uh, made by Von Kalkar, Jan von, Ka von Kalkar was the engraver that did the work for Vesalius, and he studied at the School of Titian. So uh, some of the work of von Kalkar are um, arranged pretty much like uh, the work that we see here in, in an academy, hanged by ropes because uh, by in a standing position, uh, the, the, you could have an all around view, uh, hanging from ropes, an uh, all around view of the cadaver and you could flay it uh, much better. This Saint Sebastian is clearly something that's been inspired by a cadaver who was probably uh, available in, uh, in one of the classrooms of, of, of Titian, right? So, um, in fact, Vesalius studied in, uh, in Padua in Italy and then went to teach to Bologna where uh, anatomy was uh, in, uh, uh, restarted in the 1370s. So about two, two centuries before Vesalius uh, eventually finished this, his uh, De Humanis Corporis Fabrica, the, the book of anatomy that became the first systematic treaty of anatomy. Um, but these are examples of um, the um, sharp intellectual eye, as I described it before, of the artist of uh, the Renaissance. On the left, we have uh, a leg by Michelangelo, which is incredible. It's uh, you, you, all the muscles are there, right? So these artists were uh, dissected. All of these artists were dissected personally. So as I already mentioned in previous lectures, the, that experience is a very um, powerful experience that, that uh, really we, will, it's not just about understanding the, or remembering the muscles, but it's also becoming aware of the physicality of the body, of the, of the physical aspect of the body. And you, after that, you, you don't go, you don't do uh, mannerized bodies or polished bodies. And we might see later on during the mannerism or neo neoclassical, that experience is too powerful and also too fascinating to, um, to, to forego. So we see Michelangelo on the left, and we see Leonardo uh, below, where he uh, uh, just incredibly beautiful visualization of the muscles rendered as uh, strings to better visualize the origin and research of the muscle. And, um, and you, see, you see how all these muscles are rendered as a string, the pectoralis, right? And that way he uh, beautifully synthesizes the, the muscle, but also uh, shows you more clearly uh, how the fibers are organized. And uh, they, they, they basically, he visualizes the, the inner uh, elegance also of the muscle. It's not just uh, um, uh, visual showing muscle, it's also um, creating a typical visualization of, um, of the muscle, right? On the above here, we see uh, a, a hanging a dead body, probably from uh, from the school, uh, by the, by Raphael, 
And in here we see uh, a, a, a life drawing by Raphael where the lower leg here is flayed, right? So on the upper part in here, under imaging here, we see a sketch by Raphael and look how incredibly uh, interesting is. Uh, we have the uh, study of Christ uh, drawn as a skeleton and then the Virgin Mary holding him. So probably this is a Pieta, but he is clearly using here the method um, devised by Leon Battista Alberti um, about, uh, I would say 150 years later, le earlier of uh, uh, approaching the human body as a building, starting from the, from the foundation and the basic, the basic structure and then building up on top of, the, of it. Um, so start from the skeleton and the muscle and then the skin and then the clothes and then giving it life. Right? So in, oh yeah, what happened? Uh, here we go. Oh no, let me try this, right? There you go. So now here, um, what I did, I create, this is from the book, right? Finally, you're saying, right? This is from the book. And uh, uh, it's a series of um, uh, images I created to show two things. One is, is that this, is, this, is, this can be synthesized as the Florentine structural method, right? So they, again, going back to Leon Battista Alberti, he says, well, the artist should first draw the skeleton, then the muscle, then the skin, et cetera, and then the flesh, and then the clothes, et cetera. So in this case in here, I did, um, I visualized the, that method, but um, also at the same time, uh, I tried to do a study to see if, uh, uh, how accurate, uh, Michelangelo, forgive me, right? Uh, how accurate Michelangelo's work is, and no surprise here, is incredibly accurate. So what I did, I took the, um, uh, going to this image in here, right? I visualized, I marked the basic landmarks, right? So um, what are the landmarks? The landmarks are, uh, points in the figure where the skeleton is palpable. Or uh, in the case of the soft landmark are on the surface, uh, like the nipples, like the linea alba, like the navel, like the inguinal ligament. And these are soft landmarks, right? But the, the skeletal landmark are point where the skeleton is visible. So why do I care about those? Because if I find those just as dots in the thin line, I can reconstruct reconstruct the skeleton, right? So I'm looking at my model and say, this is not David, it's a model in the classroom. And what I do, I'm gonna start looking for a structural aspect. I don't want to start copying the figure uh, uh, to following, following the lines and the curves. I want to synthesize, I want to analyze uh, systematically my subject to have access to the structure that gives it its strength, its balance, his coherence in terms of volume and forms, et cetera. So um, in this case in here, I found uh, the sternal notch, the clavicles, I found the head of the humerus, the sternum, the costal arch, the end of the rib cage here, more or less, the iliac spine, one and two, uh, the pubic bone, the knees, et cetera. And with those, I reconstructed the skeleton, right? And that's how you, that's how you would fit the skeleton inside the figure. You have to anchor it to, the uh, the landmark, right? The skeletal landmark. After that, right? After that, what I did, I built the skeleton, the muscle on top of it, and uh, and it's incredibly accurate. Michelangelo, again, no surprising here. He started dissecting when he was sixteen, and then he dissected the whole, the whole life. He also tried to do um, a uh, a treaty, like a, a, an anatomical treaty for artists, like Leonardo did. But they were too busy uh, painting ceilings and uh, and uh, sculpting, you know, hitting ch chunks of marbles with a hammer, right? So they didn't have time to do that. Uh, but they did produce a great number of um, uh, drawings that were uh, supposedly to be used as a, a basis for an anatomical publication. Um, so in this case here, this is this is a the battaglia. Um, uh, Battaglia delle Cascine, and uh, it's it's a copy. It's a copy by uh, an engraver that copied uh, this from a copy of I think uh, Rubens. And um, but you, just to tell you how similarly to the Battle of Colaiolo, 
Uh, but you see how incredibly miraculous the anatomy of this work. And here, even, even through the mediation of not just one artist, but two artists, right, that probably did not understand anatomy very well, you see that of the, um, the excusing here of this battle is to show the human body in, uh, in different uh, level of torsion and movement, different angles, um, um, but also not just that, uh, the body is so so uh, disposed and moved and interacting uh, are uh, conveying a sense of urgency, a sense of anguish, like this this old man in here probably reaching for the young man that probably is his son, and uh, and are getting ready for battle. They are being caught unprepared by um, by the enemy, and they were taking a bath. <laughs> and the enemy is coming, right? So quick, quick, put your breeches on, right? Put your breeches on, right? Like that. So. Um, uh, sorry, guys, I don't know why it's doing this, but it's, there you go. So now, what happened uh, at a certain point, and uh, um, I think this is an important passage, uh, at the uh, basically at the height of Renaissance, we have Luther and the uh, Reformation and Counter-Reformation. So we have the two heroes, if you want, of each. Uh, on the left, we have Luther, and on the right, we have St. Ignacio of Loyola, uh, Reformation, to the left, counter-reformation to the right. You also might want to notice the different in um, fashion statement, right? <laughs> I would say that Luther is, um, is more a, a cool New Yorker at the art or art opening, always uh, wearing in, in, in black with a beret, with a, he just needs um, glasses, right? And he would be the very cool art critic. So the Ignacio of Loyola instead, he's um, much more flamboyant, um, uh, could also be a New Yorker, right, with a very flamboyant uh, 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 garb in here, um, with the divine inspiration hitting him. But you can see from here, you can see the two basic approaches to um, religion. One, very rational, right, um, and uh, matter of fact. The other one, um, uh, emotional, um, inspired, um, and really not rational because, because rationality, the rationality of the Renaissance that we have described so far uh, is what created all this trouble. So the Bible got translated, people start thinking and reading, and then we have the Reformation. So the Jesuit pushed back with the Counter-Reformation and, um, and we have now uh, Baroque, right? I would say Baroque is the period that epitomizes the, the, the Counter Reformation, but but um, so the Jesuit uh, and the Council of Trento describe what it is that artists have to do uh, in uh, when they paint art, meaning they the the, the the church start deciding again what can be painted, what is proper to be painted, what is not proper to be painted. So the artist had to deal with that, right? The artist become, again, described as uh, the painting, the art becomes, again, the, the Biblia pauperum. Biblia pauperum means the, is the Bible of the poor people, meaning people that uh, pa, pa, pauper, the, the poor, uh, is also, was also synonym of, of illiterate. So uh, if you are, um, it's not today, like today, we have a lot of rich people that are illiterate, right? At the time, it was, um, uh, if you were poor, you were illiterate. If you are rich, you had an education. So in here, we see that <clears throat> the, uh, the paintings become, again, a way of transmitting the gospel or, or the content of the Bible via images, because people could not read it. That was one of the, it was sanctioned by the Counter-Reformation. But the artists say, wait a second, I just don't want to be an illustrator, right? Because I'm a painter and I want to come up with my own concept. And, um, but they always have to sneak it in, right? They had to sneak it in. So um, Caravaggio always challenged those limits. And in fact, uh, in fact, I think um, that's what makes his genius, right? He knew anatomy very well. He knew absolutely anatomy incredibly well. Um, some say he didn't, but looking at his work, I think, I think he is really new anatomy incredibly well. And that was in fact indispensable to know anatomy uh, because um, another dictation of the, of the Counter-Reformation is that the artist must study anatomy. 
because when uh, you had a seed of martyrdom, that seed of martyrdom has to be very, very convincing and real. It has to convey uh, a sense that the martyred uh, saint is suffering. It has to convey the fact that that really happened, right? It has to make you feel there, right? So, um, and also, most of all, uh, a painting uh, has to convince people through emotions. A painting has to leverage emotions and not rationality. Well, you can imagine why. So emotions make you do, do or think things that you would not accept rationally, right? So it becomes a very subtle uh, method of propaganda. In fact, the Jesuit also in invented uh, propaganda, which is propaganda fide, right? The propagation of the faith. And it is of this period. So in this time here, we see now that the martyrdom or the crucifixion of St. Saint, Saint Peter is upside down, but um, Caravaggio makes it look like they are, they are uh, um, uh, masons kind of lifting a, a piece of rock or something. They're working and grunting and sweating. There's really nothing. And also St. Peter seems to give direction, say, watch it, watch it, watch it. You're hitting a, you're hitting a vase there, right, with the cross, right? He doesn't seem to be uh, uh, suffering much because he's a saint, right? But his crucifixion with his nail going through the hands, etc., are, are quite real, right? And this struggle uh, of these, these, these workers, right? Because they really do look like uh, uh, carpenters, right? Uh, or lifting this, this guy here upside down, uh, it's, it's quite, quite realistic. Look at the dirty feet of, of the person on the, on the, you know, the, at, the, at the bottom left, you hear these dirty feet. They are so incredibly real, right? Um, uh, they, they, the idea of Caravaggio was this, was to challenge the, the limits of, of all type, right? Light and dark, time, right? So this, this, this uh, example, this work, this, all this work in here um, happened not uh, uh, 1500 years prior uh in, uh in in Palestine but happened now in Rome is the people are all dressed like Roman of the time so it challenges that that time the people are not biblical characters are Roman people are people that live there so he challenges this in the sense that uh he's saying this is not happening back then it's happening now again and you are here living it so he travels through time uh he travels through um, uh, he uses light to challenge the form because you see in certain areas the the form is completely uh, uh, overwhelmed by by the shadow, right? So that's that's it. Open form versus closed form, right? And you see on the left, I particularly like the um, uh, Saint Thomas, the painting of Saint Thomas, the incredulous Saint Thomas, because uh, it has an incredible symbology. Which is so number one, the first the first thing we see is, is this division here, right? See this line here, right? There's a line here. That line, I think, symbolizes the uh the divine versus the uh the human, right? And these three men, especially St. Thomas, is peeking his head through that, kind of reaching into the divine dimension and putting the finger inside God, right? So that act is, is so incredibly powerful that I don't think the Reformation had this in mind when they were thinking of using emotion, but Caravaggio really uh, is now testing that limit, right? And um, you know, you know the, 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 the gospel situation when Christ comes back uh, to, to visit his followers and all of them recognize him except from Thomas. And Thomas said, who are you? It's me, I'm your master, and I'm not really sure. So Thomas, so Christ says, why well, do you put your finger in my wound? But in, in the gospel, I don't think that happens. I'm pretty sure that don't ha doesn't happen. Thomas said, no, no, I believe you. But Caravaggio brings it, keeps going with that, and puts the finger of Thomas inside himself. So now that is can be seen. This, this incredible act, this incredible uh, image here can show both uh, uh, this, this uh, terrifying moment where Thomas 
finds its figure inside the divinity and who knows what feels, right? But I also like to think that this could be seen in a different way. This could also be uh, uh, the inquisitive mind of humans that go exploring everything. They go exploring the divine as well as anatomy. Because if you think about that, the finger goes inside of the physical body, right? This is a moment where the, 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 the physicality is very important, again, as I said before, because it really emphasizes, puts, put, put the attention on the actual death and, sort of, and physical death of Christ to make the sacrifice so much more real and convincing, right? So now that finger, I like to think, is a scientific finger that goes exploring inside the divinity and uh, uh, philosophically, anatomically, uh, conceptually. And I find it, I find it, if I had the money, I would buy it. It's just incredibly powerful uh, painting and artwork, right? So, um, and now in here, what I did, I went, I, because then I'm gonna start with some images that show how to use the, um, how to use the, uh, the anatomy, right, from the book. So in here we see the painting of Caravaggio on the, on the oh, sorry, on the left, right? Um, that, um, um, sorry, on the right, that is uh, the calling of St. Thomas. St. Thomas is here, right? And, um, um, and, uh, and what it is, is uh, um, Christ is, so, sorry, sorry, not St. Thomas, St. Matthew, right? St. Matthew. St. Matthew was a tax collector and was living a dissolute life and gambling and beating up people to extract taxes and eventually gets a calling. So we have here this incredibly beautiful composition where we see um, a division, again, as we saw before, between the divine and the human, right? The, the divine is, uh, and the sublunaris, the, the, the world under the moon where the human live, right? Sublunaris. This is a Roman tavern, right? And Christ now, uh, send his, 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 uh, his uh, uh, inspiration, divine inspiration to Matthew that is still not aware of it. And this, 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 this inspiration, this conversion is sent by the light, which is now during this period, uh, um, uh, metaphoric for God, right? The divine inspiration, the light, right? So it's seen here where we have this light coming through like this, right? And uh, um, this circle, the circle of thugs, because that's what they were. They were thugs going up people up to, beating people up to collect taxes. They, they would keep the percentage. Is like a, a baseball mitt. See that it catches, catches the, the inspiration and hands up in here. Right? But he's kind of, he kind of dense, right? They have to kind of call him and say, hey, hey, Jesus is calling you, right? Because he's too much engrossed in in the in the uh, in the money collecting. Um, this was made probably um, uh, 1600, 1599, 1600, right? And this one instead is 30 years later. Uh, this is this is Velasquez on the left, and you see there's a similar a similar uh, composition, but it going from what from the left to the right. You see still this this baseball mid catching catching the Apollo's order, right? Um, and and it's not a sacred painting; it's a profane painting, but Look how, what an incredible dis display of an anatomical knowledge we have here from, from Velasquez. Where we have the front view, we have the back view, we have the, set, this, the side view, and then we have the three-quarter bent view, right? So it's, it's almost like an anatomical uh, um, uh, demonstration that I, I would do in a classroom or an anatomy teacher would do in the classroom. You show the body from different point of view. Uh, and uh, and um, in here, what I did with this, um, I created a dissecting a masterpiece. So dissecting a masterpiece is a study that's similar to what I did with um, uh, the David, right? Um, um, I analyzed the work to see how accurate the anatomy is. And again, no surprise, incredibly accurate, right? So starting from the skeleton blocking in the, uh, the clavicle, the sternal notch, the head of the humerus in here, the joint, the, uh, the olecranon, the elbow joint, the olecranon, uh, the wrist joint, the ulna and radius and all this stuff. And uh, the uh, inside of the tibia with this little bump in there, that little bump in there is, is the goose foot, right? The, the pesan serinus with the tuber tuberous to the tibia. Uh, I mean, all these things are so incredibly well positioned down to the most minute detail. 
this is not imitation. This is conceptualization of the human body. They come from a great knowledge of the anatomical structure. So again, they were studying anatomy thoroughly. And um, um, probably, I don't know if Velasquez dissected personally, or I don't know if um, Caravaggio dissected personally, but uh, nevertheless, the anatomical knowledge of these artists is, is quite, quite remarkable. We can see here the brachio radialis, we can see that the tricep, the, the, the head of the tricep, the tendon of the tricep, and the delta in, in between the two volumes, it's incredibly, incredibly accurate. So then from there, I create I studied other uh, other components, right? Uh, where the image on the left is Vulcan, probably, and the other one are assistants. And the skeleton, the skeleton proportion, both in the front and in the back view. And you can you can extrapolate the skeleton from this image quite accurately. So if you look at this line here, right? What that is, that is the acromion. And it's typically exactly like that. The acromion goes, this is this bumping here at the junction between the spinal scapula and the acromion, and then move on to the clavicle. This is the vertebral margin of the scapula, of course, and this is not the bone of the scapula, is the teres major. Uh, in here, you have the spine, you have the erector spine, you have the, the you have everything. Everything is incredibly correct, right? And in fact, I uh, have another image here, right? where I created now going from the skeleton to the muscle to the external forms. So uh, throughout my book, I have this uh, connection, uh, correspondence between uh, um, the, the deep uh, layers of the skeleton and the superficial layer of the skeleton. So I don't need to go over this again, but you see what, what I'm saying. If you can layer up uh, the muscle, starting from the structure, um, starting from a from a, a an artwork like this one, it means that the anatomy is is quite quite uh, correct, right? So in this case, it's a, an example I did with uh, uh, from starting from a drawing uh, from a photograph uh, from uh, Croquis Cafe, right? Uh, all these uh, uh, side became very popular suddenly, right? So. Um, Different, you know, you, we can analyze the form from this point of view. This is more like a, a lines of action, right? Lines of action or synthesizing this this pose with the, if just basic if, uh, uh, line, as few lines as possible, trying to capture the more than an anatomical uh, aspect or structural aspect, the soul, the spirit of the movement, if you want, trying to synthesize the the, the movement, but also the aesthetic aspect, right? So the aesthetic aspect that can be almost like a, um, um, a distilled, a distilled visualization of, uh, of uh, the, the organic and structural complexity of the figure. So uh, after that, um, uh, I tackled the, 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 the I, I drew the figure, actually, let me, let me look at this, right? I drew the figure like this, right? Um, where I, I um, dissected, um virtually dissected the the image um position and again the muscle are visible no surprise here that's a picture so the muscle are all there but the and then eventually from here uh the skeleton i right, try to to find the, the, the skeletal structure but the thing is this is that when you see a little bump here a little bit bump in there if you don't know what that bump is um, you might position it a little bit higher, a little bit lower, a bit too forward, etc. Once you know that what that bump is, you know that one bump represents the trochanter, the other bump represents the extremity of the femur, and now you can draw the femur. You can connect uh, the two bumps and with the femur. And then if you see another bump below here and so on, you can connect all these bumps. And suddenly those bumps are uh, uh, have names, uh, have a function, and they come beautifully, harmoniously together, and it can become the structure of your artwork, right? So um, in here, uh, same thing, I did uh, uh, a similar work uh, using uh, the uh, Doriferos, the spare bearer of Polycletus on the left. Um, similarly, the anatomy of this work is not necessarily very realistic like it would be in the David uh, or in our painting, painting that we've seen earlier on, but in accurate, very accurate too, right? The David tend to be much more accurate because there is much more uh, anatomical description 
um, because um, um, Michelangelo, again, he was dissecting. Uh, Polycletus was maybe dissected, we don't know that, but he write more on an idealized anatomy based on sound anatomical knowledge, but it was then, let's say, polished or revisited or, or systematized, uh, taking away some of the harshness or, or I would say harshness, but the realism that in a classical work might be a little bit too much, too distracting, right? But the David um, has a in, very interesting balance between uh, idealized form and realistic forms, because many more bumps, many more um, um, details that tell us about the knowledge that he had uh, about the human body. Uh, this is a plate that you, two plates that you find in the book, and it's um, a chart that what I show uh, the landmarks, right? The landmarks, there is also another chart which I did not include in this lecture. Um, it's not a chart where I show um, uh, the external forms and the correspondence between uh, internal and external forms. But, but the idea um, in this book is to kind of be able to identify these landmarks in the model, as we know. And this is where the, I heard, um, it was a cry from help, uh, for help from a student. Like when we're in the classroom and we try to identify the landmarks, it's difficult, it's difficult, especially because there's a great variability between uh, models. And sometimes, and actually very often, these landmarks are very subtle. So with this book, I, in, in this chapter in here, I set out to, to uh, enumerate, catalog all the landmarks from different points of view um, so that uh, they can be more easily identified and then used, utilized in the practice of figure drawing. So um, moving on, um, there's also, once we understand uh, the landmarks, right? We also have, um, there's a chapter in the book where I describe now how to uh, read the, the landmark in, in, in poses, in different poses. I just focus on specific um, points, uh, bumps and dots. And from those, I can reconstruct the skeleton, right? So this shadow here is the end of the rib cage, right? This sharp line here is the iliac crest. Uh, this sharp line here is the vertebral margin of the scapula. This is the serratum, and so on and so forth. One thing I read this, right, then, um, um, I can practice, we can practice using this example that again are, are in the book, uh, drawing from imagination if you want, and try to position in uh, muscles over the skeleton. But in this, in this case here, using a, a conceptualization that clearly derived from Leonardo's approach of reducing the body as, as the muscle as strings. But um, in this case here, I, want to, I wanted to put the emphasis on the harmonious uh, aesthetics here that this muscle have when they come together. So this radiating patterns like here, 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 both on the rest position, but also in movement, right? In fact, I have images in movement that show, um, uh, that show the same, the same, um, um, that show various patterns, right, created by the muscle. So um, this is another example, how to, um, um, imagine the figure on the left is the model. You see a few bumps, you get those bumps and then you fill in the rest. So what we see is just these lines in here, right? The line of the pectoralis. We see this line here, which is the line of the costal arch and then the rib cage. We see this sharp, this line here, which is the line of the crest and the dot. And that's what we see, right? So now from there, we can reconstruct what is not seen here, right? And that is the eventually the whole skeleton. And from there, we can build up the um, muscles more correctly, right? So it's really a systematic approach to reading the figure. It's a multi-layer approach. When we use a multi-layer approach, um, we have a, a much more complex um, and complete understanding of the human figure. What that does is gives us more choices and more choices of uh, interpretation or visualization uh, result in uh, more creativity, it result in creativity. So diversity, um, uh, complexity equal creativity. So meaning I don't just copy what I see in front of me, 
uh, uh, critically by I want to interpret what's in front of me um, using various approaches, various parameters, and etc. So in this case in here, I systematize also this kind of visualizable systematization of the, the, the three, the four visualizations. So on the left, we have the stereometric. Here we have the skeletal structure. Here we have the external form, and here we have the muscular, right? So all of these things in here can be accessed by uh, understanding what we see in the model. For example, as you see in this, in this work in here, we see the uh, how to read the skeleton of the leg, right? This is the figure, right? This is the figure I have in front of me. I find dots. I find one dot, one dot in here, that's a trochanter, and can with egg, an egg-shaped volume here. The pubic bone, the end of the genital, iliac crest, et cetera. And with those, you know, the tendon of the bicep with the uh, head of the fibula, with those, I can now reconstruct the skeleton, right? And once I have this, I can now move on to, um, to um, uh, add the muscular forms on top, right? Um, so, um, yeah, can you ask me a favor? Can you give me the phone? Just to see. Thank you, love. Um, so in here, in a more complex pose, right? In a more complex pose, let's say this is the model, right? And, um, thank you. And uh, um, in here, we see how, um, we can read again the skeleton, right? The skeleton here, blocking uh, blocking the essential uh, vectors of the skeleton of various bone, and then build up the skeleton from here. And having our knowledge of anatomy, we can read better uh, the pathways of of the muscle, and eventually flay the figure and uh, create uh, again. Uh, a really a virtual dissection of the, of the of the of the model, but you see, we do not imitate. One thing that I stress with the student a lot: do not imitate, don't copy a curve. You have to understand what that curve is, and that is not a curve anymore. Is the margin of the deltoid, or is the upper margin the latissimus dorsi that connects with the humerus, that uh, is then connected with the shoulder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the whole thing now becomes much more. Um, interesting, right? Because I'm not passively imitating forms, I'm interpreting form. So this takes some time, right? But it's um, the most difficult part of this is starting it, winning the uh, preconceived uh, uh, ideas we have about anatomy, uh, which is difficult. Um, if we look at the anatomy from a point of view of practical application, it becomes fun. It becomes fun because then you realize how, what a great access you have to uh, your model. You're not frustrated anymore trying to copy forms and bond. You don't come together proportionally without knowing wh why. But with this, you can have a much better um, understanding of the form and uh, and interpret them, right? Be more active, you know. So this the same thing is valid for the uh, foreshortened figure, right? So this foreshortened figure, we see how they um, um, uh, if, if, if a fairly complex angle of view can be analyzed from a stereometric point of view, as see on the right, right? And um, of course, I have the juxtaposition of the two just to see how you can synthesize. Uh, one um, one uh, realistic form into into stereometric rendering. Uh, so stereometry, by the way, is a product of the Renaissance, where the the, the forms of the human body um, are, are reduced to basic volumes, so that uh, they can be more easily measured and possibly put in perspective. But um, what they also give you, what the, what the, a, a stereometric rendition gives you is uh, also um, an objective measurement. So when I look at an arm, when I look at the rib cage, when I look at the lower leg that are for a short then my brain still refuses to believe that, for example, like in this case, the lower leg is this short. My brain will make it longer. And, uh, or my brain refuses to believe that this volume here, right, is overlapping that arm volume in there so much. And uh, why is that? Because, 
That's how our brain works, right? We make assumptions. So in order to do that, we have to detach ourselves a little bit from the organic aspect of the figure because we know figures standing up in a certain way. We know the rib cage is long. We know, we know the, the hands are smaller and we stick with that. So when we draw, uh, that's what we do, right? That's what we do. But if we step back now, we have all these forms of the body that are the synthesis of anatomical dissection and uh, uh, stereometric rendering uh, with the proportional relationship now are easily measurable. Now I look at this not as a tie, but as a measure. How long is this in relation to this, right? I just measure the length. I don't worry about anatomy paradoxically. I just want to know how big uh, and uh, how wide and what is the angle and overlapping between the various forms. So let me remove me from, from this that is uh, too, um, too complex, has too much, too much information, right? Um, so, um, so let's see. Oh, there's a question I could, I could answer, um, Deborah. So what convinced the church at the beginning of the Renaissance to re-allow artists to do a dissection when they had been, when banished for so many centuries? The thing is this, that the church really never um, banned uh, the, uh, but, but this, this is a commonly thought like that, never banned uh, uh, the section. He put, uh, he, the church put um, uh, limits to it. It has to be done respectfully. And uh, it was uh, not really widespread uh, use, but in, um, in, uh, it had to be done respectfully, right? Uh, and uh, you, you, it, it, this is probably coming from the fact that um, connected with the resurrection, idea of the resurrection, uh, where uh, the body had to be maintained whole because when you were resurrected, uh, if you had your body all over the place, it was not a nice sight, right? So, but eventually, I can't remember what Pope said that, said, you know, sentenced it, but he's the, this Pope said that it doesn't matter if the body is exploded, it doesn't matter if the body is cut in pieces, it doesn't matter when we, we resurrect will be magically whole again. So that eventually uh, uh, took up some pressure from the artists who they were, or, or, or the artists that were doing dissection. Um, but uh, still, still the sector had to be performed uh, respectfully of the human, the human uh, uh, body. So another reason, another, um, so the, 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 the dissection the dissection was uh, uh, re was restarted in, uh, in in Bologna in 1370s more or less uh, at the faculty of um, under under the request of faculty of law of jurisprudence because uh, they decided that they need to find out uh, they have a spe specific like forensic department where they would um, investigate uh, the cause of death of somebody. And in order to do that, they needed to have knowledge of the human body to dissect and see if the rich uncle had been poisoned by the, uh, you know, the uh, spendthrift uh, nephew to get the money, right? So, um, so from from there, the practice of um, of uh, anatomy dissection anatomy spread to the artist very quickly, and uh, and then eventually, uh, just a few decades later became widespread uh, practice by um, artists in Bologna and Florence and from there um, Veneto, Padua, etc. Um, so um, I, I hope I hope that that you know uh, that uh, explains it right. Um, so let's see now let's see this one here. Now in here I have now put in another sequence right uh, of uh, of uh, cases in the book right uh, we see here the um skeleton rather said but to this i also I, I rendered the whole figure this is an exercise we do in class right we draw first the figure and in this case i'm adding this now i'm in this now for the last uh, few few classes i've been adding this more and more because this uh, really visualizes the inherent, I call them inherent aesthetics of the muscular flow, right? Because they are just so beautifully connected, right? And from here, now we have uh, this um, rendering of the muscle, the figure, and then the external forms, and then the external forms, right? So, um, 
um, so meaning meaning we don't we, when we get to this point we don't copy bumps anymore right that that light light uh, uh, line that we see here we know is the division between the adductors and the and the, and the quadricep and that is pretty much the pathways of the sartorius that will go down to the side of the leg and will connect with the with the tibia and down to the medial malleolus both this way right creating that that uh, the the, the um, uh, the cupid's bow, right? And here, the same thing here and here, right? So all these forms are aesthetically connected because the connection between um, uh, the, the iliac spine here with the sartorial begins right here. This is the iliac spine. Sartorial begins in here, goes down across the leg and goes down to the side here. This is a goose foot. The goose foot continues with the, with the tibia. That is not necessarily a structural, uh, you know, a, a, um, or, or anatomical uh, structure, right? It's 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 aesthetic. It's an aesthetic. It doesn't have a necessarily functional functional uh, aspect. It's just aesthetic. But it helped our artists to draw uh, these this connection between the various parts of the body. If we don't do that, we tend to isolate bump a bump in here and bump in there. And, and as um, um, Leonardo does, does, uh, accused, uh, insulted Michelangelo, saying uh, that his drawing looked like a sack full of nuts. And, and, and so if you don't have the bump in the, right, in the right places, the figure will look like a sack full of nuts. Of course, Michelangelo knew exactly where to put the, 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 the muscle in there. And Leonardo was just you know being, being mean, right? <laughs> but can you imagine that? Being insulted by Leonardo, right? Oops. <laughs> so, but but Michelangelo could take it, right? He could take it, right? So now we see here eventually that the that the um, uh, when we look at the figure, right? This is a, a, a drawing that sometimes we do sketches in a class to study the to study the figure. When we have all this thing come together, we have the uh, the anatomy. We have uh, the structure, we have the perspective, we have foreshortening, we have uh, the uh, stereometric rendering, uh, and of course the technique. The technique is also discussed in the book, in the chapter on techniques, but you know, it's, it's not, it's not uh, let's say it's not for today, but we see here how, um, what is this little arrows here? I lost here, you go. We see how we could, we could uh, uh, look at this as, so the jugular fossa was just under here, was not visible. That's the sternum, right? So the sternum, and I see how the sternum will continue with the linea alba, we continue with the linea alba down the navel, down, down below the navel, and then to the genital. So even if, if not visible, I have to make sure that that line is, oi, that line is invisibly, uh, uh, but oh, why, what happened? I pushed some brown button, right? Let me go back a second, then I'm gonna conclude this, right? Um, so maybe, uh, you know, maybe I can answer some question, right? So yeah, um, great timing, because we, we are coming up to where we have about 20 minutes left of the program. Oh, okay, so. so let's answer some question, right? Let's answer some question, right? So okay. let's see, let's see, okay, here. I got one in the chat that I'm going to read, but I want to encourage folks, I mean, thank you, number one, Roberto, for sharing yeah, yeah, yeah. that fantastic PowerPoint with all of us. Um, and folks, we do have about 50. 20 minutes left. So feel free, please drop your questions in the chat and we will make sure to get to as many as we can. Um, and we had a great one from Alan already saying mm -hmm. that one quality of many that I appreciate of your work is the rendering of the muscles. How do you go about depicting the notion of fibers in terms of the form without going overboard with that detail? I, this is a good question. So what I do, I start as drawing the muscle without fibers as volumes, right? So I think first thing I do is I think, Starting point, ending point, volume, draw it as a volume has no fibers because the fibers are going to be a distraction, right? You Then you start rendering it as if it were a football. Imagine a football, right? There's no fibers like that, right? And then you render the volume. Okay? If the light hits in here, that's the shadow. Et Once you have the volume, the fiber go on top of it. And the fiber, you don't need a lot of fibers because the volume is already described, right? So then you go with the fibers trying to kind of have them be more packed together in certain areas, more a little bit less visible in other areas, but they also fall, the basically the fiber now will follow the form. 
Uh, if instead you start with the fibers, the fiber tend to be all flat and, and, and even, and it flattens the form and take over. The priority is, uh, is, uh, is the volume, right? So the fibers are the squeaky wheel. The squeaky meal, sorry, the squeaky wheel. The squeaky wheel gets the meal, right? They say, look at me, look at the fire, look how many we are. You draw, okay, okay, okay. I draw them, right? Um, but um, you have to say, okay, conceptualize what's important is the form, is the form. Lock in the form, render it as if we're polished, and then put in the fiber over it in function of the form. So the, the fiber had to respect the volume, right? This being said, the fiber is very important because what they do, they reveal all those, the, the, sometimes you have this, this kind of radiating pattern, right, overlap in a form like this, so fibers coming together like that. They will reveal that. So they are going to be um, really important to put in, but don't put a lot of it. Also because in, 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 a, in, a, in a cadaver or, or even a living person, you don't see them that many. They, they are not that they're not that visible. So you're gonna have fascicle group, but you don't see the single fibers that, that clearly. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you see more like a fascicle groups of fibers that kind of come, come together. Right? So it privileged the form, I would say, right? So yeah, great question. Right? So um, see if I can get to more questions. We have a bunch of questions, but I only see two. Let me see, how do I get down here? Uh, Abby, can you can you mm -hmm. see? If you yeah, can there is there's some kind comments and there's some people asking, but there's no other questions that I see as of yet. Um, we Linda did ask; she's not here anymore, but did ask about where she can see it. And just note, I am gonna drop in a link to the YouTube chat and a link to your book at the end of the program too. So feel free okay. to share that resource. Yeah, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, Anne um, asked about your upcoming workshops, which include Zoom life drawing sessions. So can you talk about how that works, teaching Zoom over, or life drawing over Zoom? Yeah, so I was, um, um, I'm a convert. <laughs> In the sense that convert are the worst type, right? The people I have friends that were smoking, 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 and stop smoking, and suddenly they bother everybody to smoke. I'm like that, right? Meaning, I didn't like online, 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 online. Now I do it and say, wow, that's cool. It's really good tool, right? So as long as we understand what Zoom can do, what cannot do, uh, we're gonna be happy about that. Meaning uh, when I started doing Zoom, I realized almost immediately that the, one, the, the main advantage are that uh, people don't have to ask me to move professor, I can't see what you're drawing, right? right? Because so, so uh, everybody is like looking right behind my shoulder, my hand, right? That because of a great, great clarity of what I'm doing. Uh, I am drawing in. Uh, I can draw in a variety of techniques. Whereas when I work uh, in the big demos that I do, life size demos, I pretty much use charcoal and chalk and color chalk on brown paper because that way people distant can see. And etc. When I draw uh, on a smaller piece of paper using my my trusted iPad here, uh, I can draw pretty much every every technique. So students also have access to a variety of techniques, charcoal and graphite and watercolor and uh, tracrayon technique and you name it. Right. Um, the other thing is that um, so they also learn the technique, different technique, and that is another thing that helps a lot because many times as I was painting. I heard uh, people like, oh, that's how you do it. I said, oh, okay, yeah, uh, you know, meaning sometime, because I don't know, we don't know what students know or what they want to know. And maybe sometimes to the don't think that, that that's the way you do it. But as you see somebody do it, uh, then you say, okay, that's how you do it. This is a great learning curve in a, in a technique, in a, in, a, in, a, in a media like this. Uh, the other thing is that you can watch it over and over again. I mean, uh, if you miss something, the concept are, I, mean, I wouldn't say over and over, but a couple of times, right? Um, uh, I would say that um, some techniques are complex, right? Are difficult. And uh, maybe, especially in watercolor courses, when they go over things, it had to go over fast because I cannot wait because the paper, the paint is drying and need to paint right away. And what happened now, students maybe they fall behind because, because they tend to mix the paint, et cetera and they miss, they miss the passage. So they can go back and watch it again. In fact, many students, and I have do exactly that. They follow 
the course, we get the first in, in Primatura, right? And then after that, they go back and then redo it and redo it and redo it. And I have many students doing it one, two, three times, and you see an incredible progression in learning. So it is definitely a it's definitely a great um, a great technique, uh, a great medium actually, a great medium that um, uh, really permits you permits me to uh, uh, convey much more. And of course, this can be um, they can be also supported by uh, drawing classes from life as soon as COVID let us right. Um, so um, yeah, so it, I, I'm, I'm, I think that that um, these online classes are, are not going to go away. I think they are very uh, important, and we have been refining them as faculty. We have been all refining them, finding all our our methods. So also following the also following the student because the other thing is that we can hear more directly from the students, and and it's a very important feedback that we have. Um, the student maybe they want to know about this, they want to know about that, and uh, maybe in the classroom people don't hey what 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 is that right don't tend not to do that, uh, but but here yeah. I receive emails, even personal email, et cetera. And um, if students don't feel like showing the work, they don't, which is also not an important thing because sometimes in the classroom, you, you know, you don't do your best work and you're like, oh my God, this sucks. I hope people don't see it. Are you feel embarrassed? And it's, <laughs> that's where we are, right? And, um, and um, but here, no, if you decide not to show, you just simply don't show it, right? And if you do, then it becomes a class experience. So people can see what you did, see my comment, and we we can still learn from, from uh, other people's work and other, their comment I give to other people. So it has a collegial uh, a quality uh, that, that is maintained, right? So that was a, that was a long answer, right? <laughs> There's a lot to say about Zoom. There's you know, a lot of. Lot I'm a convert. I, I told you when I'm a convert, right? So I'm going overboard, right? So. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple more questions I want to make sure we get to in the chat. One is just a practical one. We've gotten a question about how to access your first book. Um, we've got a constituent here from Canada. Thank oh. you for joining us, who is asking about bookstores. And then we also had Alan mentioned um, asking about your second book. So um, I'll drop a link to that. In the chat too. To make yeah, sure yeah, yeah. That promo code. The so this is second book, right? Just came out recently, and um, and it was um, like having a baby almost, um, but um, almost um, a no C section though, luckily. So, but um, they um, so the first book. What happened is uh, is um, I don't know what Amazon is doing. They are selling it for hundred twenty bucks, but if you go to a bookstore, you buy for the price, which is 35, 40 bucks. So there are, the, the COVID slowdown, there's been a, a, a shortage in paper and the pretty much pub, publishing world is, is struggling with that. On top of that, most books are printed in China and that also had problem with the COVID, et cetera, coming back and forth. So it is in uh, reprint. This is the third, the third um, uh, uh, print, the third print. Uh, and uh, it should be available in normal numbers in June, but you can find it. You can find it on the, if you go on Amazon, I wouldn't go on Amazon because they sell it for 120 bucks, um, which is fine, right? But I don't, I don't make, it doesn't make a difference for me. I would go, I, I know that the student found it at um, Strands, they found it at uh, uh, all, all the all the bookstore you might call in advance you find it there for the regular price so maybe that's what you want to do and then you buy it a strand for 30 bucks and then you put it on oh, eBay for 120 right <laughs> could do that right <laughs> then you go out and sushi on me <laughs> um. right so but it's coming it's coming and the, 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 the second the third uh, uh, print is coming and it should be here in June but you can find it just it just sometimes it's available sometimes it's not I don't know what's going on but I think it's a problem with distribution and uh, COVID related uh, um, logistical problem right so um, yeah. so the the other book um, the other book yeah it's 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 out now and you can uh, just probably find it on Amazon without um, any problem. It should be available on Amazon. So um, Amazon, I know that um, that um, some people don't want to buy on Amazon because it's uh, 
there's a strike or something going on, that's fine. But you can you can find it on uh, on um, Barnes and Noble or Strands or any any big bookstore. I'm thinking they have. I think that this book is also. I mean, the previous one is also at the Met here in New York. I go at the Met bookstore, but um, probably online you find it in a big in a big uh, uh, bookstore. You you find it other than Amazon. So yeah. Um, Perfect. So we have another question um, from Carol that's asking about um, how to start. What is the best way to start drawing figures? So kind of entry level, you know, this process that you, you talked about, or if there's other ways such as starting with shapes um, for a novice, I guess what's your... I think I know that, that could be a whole class, but in short yeah, form. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, no, I think the easiest way is, is um, this geometry is the, the dreaded boxes. Everybody hates the boxes, but the boxes, what they do in reality, they simplify the approach, meaning uh, when you find, find, you find yourself in front of a model, you say, oh my God, what do I do now, right? There's so much stuff, so much information that it can be intimidating, right? But if you say, okay, you know what? You know what? Like yeah, when you had 10 people talking, right? That's text like that. You had 10 people talking, you can follow anybody. And you got the skin and you got the bones, you got the muscle, and you got the hair, you got it. Whoa, 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 whoa. And you say, okay, I just want to know how high, how wide, and what's the angle between the parts. That's all I want to know. So in order to do that, what you do is say, okay, how big is the head compared to, to the torso, compared to the lower part? How long is the arm compared to this? And then you draw just that, lines, line or volume, volume. So by doing that, you conceptualize the body and uh, you, it's easier to measure it. It's easier to measure it because again, you don't follow, you don't get distracted by the curve here and the other curve here, you just go boom. And then you go boom, and then you go boom. That's it. So you have one, two, three, right? And or or four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You know, if you really go into the detail, you can create this kind of spiraling form, which is part of the proportional relationship by the hand, right? But uh, you find uh, the main volumes, the length and width and depth of the main volumes, and you start with those. You draw them in a cylinder. On top of those, you can superimpose more information. But in the beginning. If you draw these these boxes or or, or uh, you know boxes they call boxes right the, the stereometric rendering, it's it's a way to uh, really um, take charge over the figure. After that, you can add facial features. You can add the bumps. For example, if I have a if I have a um, uh, the, 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 the delta the army here like this, right? If I start with delta in here, I don't know where it's going to end in relation to the total length. But if I draw the total length like this, and I say, oh, this is kind of halfway down, then I know that within the given measurement, within the, uh, now this is a known entity, right? because I draw this is a known entity. Now within the known entity, I have another known entity to start halfway down. Make sense? So I know where this stops, and that's another one. So now, I have control of the form. But if I start from the blue with the line, whoa, 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 right? What am I doing here, right? When is it stopping? Where is it going? So you, you lose control, you lose control. And now you have all these floating forms. They don't really come together. It's really, once you understand the structure like this, then you can draw starting with the line because your brain now sees, okay, this is halfway down here. And then you have another half in here. Then you have something that's a little bit long, shorter here. And then another one here, this, angle like this so so what you're doing you're selecting the information that you want to do and these essential information after that so you draw in stages the first stage is not aesthetic there is no aesthetic allowed or involved it's just measurement knowing that is like oh it takes a lot of pressure off my back i'm right? aesthetic oh, what is aesthetic what is this such it's uglier no no aesthetic just a measurement right just a measurement after that that measurement is correct. Then you can invest time and energy in moving on to the next stage. If that measurement is not correct, the whole body could be right, could be wrong. And then you end up with all these long limbs and uh, small heads and big feet and tiny hands, you know what I'm saying? So they're not proportional. But if you measure first and then ask questions later, <laughs> measure first and then, and then add the volumes on top, right? So it, does it help? Does it help? Yeah, the, the, there is a spiraling for the Fibonacci sequence. Yeah, the the golden section, etc. I mean, these are all all in there. 
I think that this, this the Fibonacci, the, the equiangular spiral, the golden section, are all, all the thing that, that the concept that we want to consider, but um, we, we want to use them as a tool. All of this that I showed you, you want to use this as a tool. It's a tool, right? Meaning um, it, it, you don't want to delegate your, your aesthetic, aesthetics to the, this technique or to the knowledge of anatomy. The, if you look at all the, for example, Caravaggio, Caravaggio painted the, the body very, very well, correctly, right? But then he hides half of it. Half of it. Meaning it, the, the display of anatomical knowledge was important in the early Renaissance because they were, again, as I said before, looking at the war like a, like a young person. Like, wow, it's just, it's just, I was close inside for a year with the COVID. Now I go out and the birds and the flowers, how beautiful it is, everything, right? So the same thing in here, when, we, when, we, when, when you look at the war with a new um, method or for the first time, when you when you new method, it's like looking at the first time. So not that they didn't see the war, but they say, instead of looking at the war with the medieval, Mind, set mind, we look at it with a humanistic mind and everything is different because the method of thinking of, of for example, of, of reading or looking at the bug with your naked eyes or looking at the bug with a microscope. It's a different method of analysis. You see different things, right? So um, um, what was, I always do that, right? I, I then forget what the main point was. Let's make sure we have one more. We have one more question, and then we'll have to say goodbye to folks. Um, we someone asked if they need to read your first book before reading your second. So does it matter the order in which you consume, or or? No, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's a uh, they are they are one is movement and one is uh, and then and there's both. Uh, there's a little a little bit of overlapping in both, right? Of course, one focuses more on the structure aspect, and the other one on, on the movement aesthetic aspect. Uh, but uh, the second book has has some anatomy, um, um, the descriptive anatomy, but then the anatomy quickly moves toward the uh, functionality, the movement, etc. The previous one has some uh, as mostly systematic anatomy, and then some aesthetic aspect connected with technique, some movement, etc. Uh, but one clearly is more about. Um, um, topographic or systematic anatomy and the other is more like aesthetic and movement. So you can start with one and then you realize what the, see, typically what happens is this, like um, you you take a class in uh, in something and you realize you need something else, then you take that class. When the moment you realize that you need that, that too, it's a good moment because now you know why you need it. Make sense? So, so sometimes learning works like that. I, I don't know why I had to take chemistry, right? And then you start mixing colors. Oh, now I'm gonna take a, car, a, a class in chemistry, right? And so that's why all the colors were so, were so bad because I don't, didn't know anything about chemistry. So the same thing in here. When you um, um, a, a, a tackle a problem, if the problem re, or, or the subject uh, really um, uh, fascinates you, you're gonna take charge of your education. You know what you need. And then you go look for specific information that you need it's, it's a good place to be so you can start from either book it's doesn't matter it's just uh, as long as you buy them both <laughs> this is a great plug and before we end i wanted we had one more question asking about the class you're teaching for papa specifically on the figure and they asked how long it is it's six weeks but they also asked if it's just covering the beginning of figure drawing or if you could describe in a little more detail that class so, so you're teaching another one too they, it, it, you know, what what course is this the, the, in uh, um, the the one of, of figure anatomy or oh, figure, figure drawing figure drawing yeah, yeah no no I'm going I'm going to start with that I'm going to start with this basic uh, uh, forms and volume they need to be I'm not going to go in a lot of detail of the anatomy but the the essential volume yes because I want to direct that toward toward the the the, the figure figure anatomy so yes i'm going to deal with some structural aspect of the body structural anatomy but not in great detail like i would do layered muscle the deep muscle superficial muscle in a more specific course so it's going to be more um, directly directed toward the practice of, of, of figure drawing some technique etc so yeah it, i think it would be a good interact directory course and then from there you can take more specialized courses if you want right and, uh, so. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Roberto, for sharing your vast knowledge and that fantastic PowerPoint. And I wanted to thank everyone for being here. And 
I dropped a link to Roberto's book in the chat as well as where this video will go on YouTube. So make sure to save the chat before you leave or, um, and we hope to see you again. So thank you all. I'm gonna, if you wanna unmute and say goodbye on your way out, it's been so nice to have you. Um, but Roberto, before that, I'll let you have the final final word. Well, thank you so much, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. I know a lot of you because I've seen you in the little screen in my Zoom classes. So uh, <laughs> one day we'll meet in person, right? And thank you so much for uh, for, for showing up and uh, appreciate your uh, you know persistence <laughs> in a, in anatomy, right? And uh, and thank you, Renee. Thank you so much for introducing me, right? And and thank you, Abby. Thank you. Great, good job. And uh, it was a great uh, a great afternoon. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Right. right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Roberto. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. 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 Th